to online church. I pray that today as we praise and worship, that we will always put our strength in the God of breakthrough. Amen. This is where my heart will beat again. This is where I get set free. This is where your love is calling me. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready to cross over the line. Leave it all behind. Nothing's gonna keep me here. Oh, until I see a change. I'm lifting up your name. There's freedom in the atmosphere. I worship you, 
Because I have seen your faithfulness My fortress over and over I have a hope found in your name I have a strength found in your grace Your faithfulness my fortress over and over we've just sung and promises that we've just declared that God your name is powerful your words unstoppable the God of the impossible and I want to tell you and I want to remind you today that that's who our God is he's the God who is unstoppable his words are powerful and he's on your side and he's on my side you know we're saying that he's the way maker miracle worker And you know, today, we still believe that is the God that we serve. And today, I really believe that God is wanting to, really believe that He wants to heal people today. People who are sick, people who are emotionally down, people who feel broken. Maybe the season has taken its toll on you. I want to read you a passage found in Exodus chapter 15, verses 26. Exodus 15, 26 is the scripture where God is speaking to his people and he says that I am the Lord who heals what an amazing scripture that God says I'm not the God who healed I'm the God who heals that means he's still doing it today he's still the healer he's still the one working miracles in our lives and you know in Matthew 
chapter 15, the Bible speaks about Jesus and it says that as He came into Capernaum, that a vast crowd was there following Him. And as they brought the crowd to Him, the Bible says that there were many sick, many who were lame, many who couldn't see, many that could not speak. And, and it says that as they brought them to Jesus, and it says many more who were inflicted, but as they brought them to Jesus, He healed them. And you know, today I want to encourage us that we serve a God who heals. His name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. And right where you are, the Bible says that if we believe, we have faith as small as a mustard seed. That if we believe that our God heals, we don't have to be in a building together. We don't need somebody to speak it over our life. All we got to do is we got to believe right where we are, that our God is the God who heals. And right now in your house, or wherever you find yourself, and you need healing in your body, if you've got physical sickness, you've got disease in your body right now, I want to encourage you to take your hand, lay it on that part of the body that you believe in God to heal you. And I want you to speak over your body right now. And I want you to speak, say that sickness, whatever that sickness is, call it out right where you are. If it's cancer, if it's, if it's diabetes, whatever it is, I want you to declare over it and say right now in the name of Jesus, I declare that you will bow down to the name of Jesus and I believe that my body is healed and made whole in Jesus' name. If you believe in God for emotional healing, I want you to place your hand on your heart right now and say, God, I believe that you are the God who heals me. You are the God who restores me. You are the God who makes me whole again. Right where you are. Church, come on, if we believe it today, let's pray right now. I'm going to pray the prayer of agreement. The prayer of agreement is simply this, where two or three believe in my name and are gathered together that I am there present with them. And how many of you know when God is with us, miracles can happen. So let's pray right now in the name of Jesus. I'm believing God right where you are in your house that there is going to be the move of God. There's going to be the power of God. There's going to be supernatural healing that takes place in Jesus' name. Let's pray right now. Father God, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we believe that through the name of Jesus, through the suffering of Christ on the cross, that God, we are healed by the stripes of Jesus. So God, I pray for every sick person right now. God, I thank you right now that healing would flow through their bodies. God, that they would receive breakthrough right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, I believe that cancer is a name. Diabetes is a name. Leukemia is a name. Alzheimer's is a name. Any blood disease is a name. Whatever the name is, that it bows down to the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank You right now. Miracles are taking place. God, that healing is flowing through bodies right now in Jesus' name. God, I pray for people, God, that feel emotionally broken, God. God, I pray not only that you are the healer of the sick bodies, God, but you're the restorer of the soul. And so, Lord, right now, I thank you that you're bringing healing and restoration to people who feel emotionally broke down, broken down. And God, I thank you right now. You're restoring them. You're making them whole. You're healing them in Jesus' name. You're the God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. So we give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, if you believe that you are healed, that you are made whole, Give God some praise right where you are. Church, you know, we serve a God who heals. He's not only the God who saves us, He's the God who heals us. And I believe right now that as we prayed over you, I believe that you healed. 2,000 years ago at the cross, Jesus paid the price for every sickness, every disease, every infirmity, every iniquity. He paid that price. So I want you to encourage you today that as you go through the day, just keep speaking healing over your body. Keep speaking healing over your soul and your emotional state of being right now. And I believe that we're going to see God do some great miracles because that's what He's famous for. He's the God of exceedingly, abundantly, the God of the impossible. Such a good God we serve. And hope you're doing well today and you're ready to go into a time of giving. And so as we get ready to go into a time of giving, I just want to encourage us around our giving today from a passage found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 15. And it says here in the passage, it says, As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. 
Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you, Paul is saying. This is what Paul's heart is. He's saying, I want God to work in this situation of your generosity. And he says, rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, he says, I have all I need and more. I'm generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. Look what he goes on and he says, they are a sweet smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches. Look at what it says, all your needs, every single need. It's amazing when you open up your heart to God, when you open up your life to God, what God can do out of his abundant supply. He says he'll supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. I love this passage because Paul is saying, not all churches have a generous spirit. He says, but you, the church in Philippi, you know, I think if Paul was alive today and he was doing the offering on this platform today, he'd say, church of Ramah South, you're different from other churches. You have a generous spirit. You have supplied. And Paul is commending them and thanking the church for their generosity, for getting the gospel out to people who desperately need to hear it. You know what I think about this passage? There's a couple of points that just stick out to me. Is that the first thing is this, is that generosity creates the opportunity for others to know God. Do you know that through our giving and getting online services and just being able to continue church in the way, it's been able to reach people way beyond our province, even our nation, reaching people all over the world. And it's all because of the generosity of our church. And then he says that, you know, to the church, he says, you know, your generosity wasn't restricted. You know what Paul is saying is that their generosity was not determined whether they were in the building or not. That their generosity towards God never changed based on the circumstances or the season that they found themselves in. And you know, this is what I love about you and me as a church of Ramah South is that we haven't allowed this season from stopping us from being generous towards God because we haven't been in a building or we haven't been together seeing the tangible things but we've trusted that our generosity is going to be impacting people's lives and you know whether we're, whether we're in church in person or whether we're doing church online it doesn't change our spirit of being generous towards God and then the third thing I love is that he goes on and he says our giving is pleasing to God and the reason our giving is pleasing to God is because when we give we demonstrate the nature and the character of God because God is a giver. He's a giver of life. He's a giver of healing. He's a giver of hope, joy, peace. Whatever we need in the seasons that we find ourselves in, God is willing to give it to us. He's already given it to us. All we've got to do is we've got to lay hold of it. And the fourth thing is this, that he says that I like about the scriptures that it points out is that generosity towards God's house and the work of God opens heaven's perspective provision over our lives so simply saying that when we are generous towards God's house you know the church Paul was saying to the church you've been generous to the work of gospel allowing me Paul to speak into the life of other churches and as a result of that God's provision was opened up towards that church because he says that God will richly provide for all your needs and I'm praying that over every person in our church who's been so generous so committed so faithful so focused on building God's house in this season. And I want to encourage you that when you open up your life to the work of God, all your needs will be met according to Christ's riches. And I pray that over your life today. So let's get ready in our giving today. Right where you are, there's different opportunities or ways that you can give into our church today that are going to come up on your screen. Let's take our offering. Let's be prepared as we give today. Father, as we give to you today, God, we just thank you, Lord. For the wonderful opportunity, Lord, of just being a part of your kingdom and giving to church, Lord. And God, I pray a blessing over every person. God, I pray that you would bless them, that you would increase them, that you would provide for them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hello, church. We are so excited today to be able to gather together online in the presence of God for another life-changing service. It's hard to believe that we've already been doing online church for eight months, but we are so encouraged by the buy-in and participation of you, our church. In fact, we are still reaching more people weekly online than we were this time last year during live services. 
So if the online church services are helping you, then why not share the link and invite as many people as you can to join us for one of our online services. We know that God changes lives and one of the major ways that He still does this is through the local church. And so I want to encourage you, if you are visiting with us for the first time today, it's so good to have you with us. You can click on the necessary link on the screen. Good to have you with us. If you've got a prayer request or a testimony that you want to share with us, please feel free to send it straight through to us. And so right now, we're going to get ready to go into the next part of our service as we receive a message. So why don't you open up your hearts, lean in. I believe God's going to, word is going to speak into your life today. It's going to bring great transformation. And remember, God is for you. He's on your side. Enjoy the message. Church, it's so good to bring you God's Word today. You know, there is so much power in God's Word. And whatever it is you're going through or facing, God's Word gives us the victory. And if you need direction to navigate a situation, God's Word is a lamp to your feet. It's a light that paths the way for you. And maybe you're trying to overcome pain and loss. I want to encourage you that God's Word and the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And God's Word says that He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And you know, today what I want to do is I want to carry on from last week's message and I titled the message, God, what's going on? And the idea behind the title is, you know that in your life at times there are things that are not the way they're supposed to be. And you know that the promises of God are true. You know they're real. Yet what you're experiencing and your reality doesn't line up with what God has spoken. And you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I'm supposed to be further or things are, are not supposed to be like this. This is not right. And you're thinking, what's going on? Why is this all happening in my life? And you know, this is such a real thing that happens in our life. We all go through a time in our life where we, we ask the question, what's going on? You know, there was a certain event that I'll never forget about that took place in my life. It was in the year 2001. I remember that year so clearly because in the beginning of that year, Shelley and I got married. And uh, later on in the year, we were out at a furniture store, busy buying furniture for our house. And that's what you do when you get married as a husband. You go shopping with your wife and buy furniture. Come on, man, you've got to earn some brownie points there, up for grabs there. And I clearly remember it was about quarter past four in the afternoon as we were in the store walking around that I happened to look up at the TV while looking at the furniture. Anybody who said men can't multitask, they were lying. And as I look up at the TV, I see these headlines, terrorist attack in New York. And I called Shelly and I said, Shelly, come and look at this. This is insane. This is crazy. And, and as we're looking at the TV, suddenly the second plane just collides into this building and, and I said to Shetty, come on, we got to get out of here. We got to go home. And, and as we are now driving on our way home, my sister and her husband, we get a phone call from them and they're like, man, have you seen what's going on? And I'm like, it's crazy. This is insane. I've never experienced anything like this. And they said, well, listen, we're coming over. And they came over to the house and we started talking about the world is coming to an end. And my brother-in-law, I'll never forget it. He's like, what are we going to do, Don? Things are falling apart. This is the beginning of another world war. And, and I'm like, this is not... This is not right. This should not be happening. What's going on? I am just got married. I still want children. I still want to build a life. I still want to have a future. And all of this is happening around me. And I so clearly remember just thinking to myself in my mind, what is going on? You know, this is exactly how Gideon felt. This is exactly how the nation of Israel are feeling in this situation. They're unable to advance in life. They're unable to move forward. Whatever they do, wherever they go, they're surrounded by their enemy and their lives are in danger, even risk from being taken by the enemy. And so in Judges chapter 6, what we looked at last week is that, that they had to identify a few things in their life. And the first thing they had to identify was that they had done evil in God's eyes. And the, so they had to realize that they had to repent. They had to repent of, what they were, of, of their sin. The second thing is that they had to reprioritize God. And then they had to identify that they had to remember who God was and that God is more than enough. And so let's continue the story in Judges chapter 6. It says here that the Midianites were so cruel 
that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountain caves and strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying the crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all their sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. You know, this is insane. You've got to get a picture of this. Uh, you know, this is not what they were expecting. To them, this is not making sense. Why they are going through this, why they are allowed to experience this. Let me give you some context to why this would not be making sense. It's because the grandparents and the parents of these people occupying the land, the children of Israel, their parents, through the power of God, were able to go into the promised land and possess the promised land, defeating all the enemies. And they'd come in off the back of living in the promise of God and experiencing the promises of God and enjoying life just as God had promised that He would give them. And yet a few decades down the road, Gideon and Israel are reduced to living in the caves instead of living in the fertile land, living and occupying the land that God had given them. And they're asking this question, hey, what's going on? You know what I realize? It's so easy to know that God's got such great plans for us and there's promises over our life and He's made them available to us in His Word and have them right before you, but never experience them. And if that's you, you know what? The best thing that you and I can do is ask the question, what's going on, God? What's going on? You see, the enemy often does this in our life is that he'll try and distract you from the purposes of God or lie to you about the goodness of God, sometimes deceive you by making you think that the plans and promises of God are not for you so you can settle where you are and settle for a life less than, thinking that this is it. But today I want to remind you that we're not going to settle that we're not going to be a people that just accept what's happening. 2020 has been a year with so much uncertainty, so much change. But I want to encourage you that our God never changes. Our God is constant. He's certain in His promises. He never changed them. The world can turn upside down, my friends. I want to tell you this, is that things can go haywire, but our God is the same yesterday. He's the same today, and He's going to be the same tomorrow. He's the same forever. And the name of the Lord is a strong tower. He's our place of refuge. He's our fortress. He's our strength. And I want to remind you that you're not a settler. You're not a quitter. You may have had some hardships. You're facing some challenges in your life. You could have even made some mistakes, but it's time to stand up again. It's time for you and I to start looking to the God of heaven and earth, connecting your life to His power not identifying just with the situation and the challenges, but connecting to God's power. This is exactly what happened to Gideon, is that Gideon connected his life to God's power. This is what I like about Gideon, is that Gideon, even though he sees everything that's going on and God comes and speaks to him, you know, Gideon's got a whole lot of spunk. He's got a whole lot of attitude when it comes to this. And sometimes in our life, you know what, I don't realize that we've got to get our 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 mojo back. We've got to get our, our, our spunk back. We've got to get this little bit of, okay, God, why is this happening to us if this is all your promises? And look what it goes on and it says here, it says that the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Oprah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Ebiezer. And Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say that the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord, he's actually abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. Then the Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. You know what I love is that Gideon, he's just so honest. He's so afraid. He's so uncertain. He's insecure about who he is because of everything that's going on in his life. And you know, today I know that there are people in our church that are listening today and you could be feeling exactly like Gideon in this season. You're afraid. You're uncertain. Maybe you're even discouraged. You're disconnected from God and all everything around the season has really had an impact on you and everything happening out there is trying to erode everything that's on the inside of you, your faith, your belief, what you are trusting God for 
people, your expectation in your life. And you know, the truth is this whole story is this whole story is about position. The story about Gideon is about position. You see, the position that Gideon and the nation are finding themselves in is they're finding themselves in a position where they're hiding, they're living in caves, they're dodging the enemy, they're trying to protect what they have. It's not a healthy position that God wants them to live in. But the truth is, is this is that it also talks about God's position. You see, their natural position was a direct result because of a God's spiritual position in their life. And the moment they got God in the right position in their personal lives, everything in their natural life started to change. You see, the position that God has in our life directly impacts our position. And instead of us hiding, we can start going to occupying and we can start going to a place where we're taking territory and living in the land that God has us. You see, Gideon hiding in a wine press shows of how afraid and how fearful he is about of his losing his own life. And it also speaks about the size of his harvest and how limited his, his harvest was. And so this is what's so great about God is that when Gideon asks the question, calls on God, God answers him. God meets him right where he is in his situation. And there's this conversation that goes on between the supernatural and the natural, between heaven and earth. And as the angel of God is speaking to Gideon, he says to him, hey, Gideon, you're a mighty hero. And I think like, think about Gideon in this moment. Gideon's hiding. You can picture him. Like when he hears the word mighty hero, Gideon's like, you're looking for someone? You, you, you're looking for a mighty hero? It's just me, yeah? I think you got the wrong person. <laughs> I think you've been led to the wrong address. I think your, your, your Google Maps <laughs> directed you to the wrong address. They should have said recalculating route. You'll be at your destination in 10 minutes time. Your destination will be on your right-hand side. And Gideon's like, man, I think you've made a mistake. Mighty hero? That's not me. In my family, my, we're not even counted in this nation. And in my family, I'm the least of all people. And Gideon's like, okay, even if I am a mighty hero, why is all of this going on? What's going on right now? Why is this all happening to us? Why are we going through these struggles? We wouldn't expect going through this if this is who we truly were. He's asking God a whole lot of questions. Where are all the miracles that we've been told about? Where's, all, where's the power of God? Where's the promises of God? We, we like disconnected. We all we're experiencing is hardship, adversity, affliction, everything which we're going through. And Gideon's got so many questions. And maybe today you just feel like Gideon. You weren't ready for this season. You weren't ready for what 2020 had. And you, you, you were like connected to God. And suddenly everything has changed in your circumstances. Everything has happened in your life. And you're asking God, what, what's going on? What's happening if you are my God? What is the situation? And, and as we look at this passage and how God responds to Gideon, I love this. It says, Then the Lord turned to him again and said, Go with strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. And he goes on, and I'm just going to repeat it again. The Lord Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in the entire family. And the Lord said to him, I will be with you. You know, when you read this passage, this is not the answer Gideon was looking for. Gideon was looking for a justification. He was looking for excuses. He was looking for reasons why this is happening. And God commissions him. And I love the way God responds to him. God responds to him and he says, go out in the strength that you have. I will be with you. You will defeat them as if you're fighting one man. You know, church, that's all we need is that we need to know. We need to know what God is asking us to do. Go and do it and believe that he is with us Trust his word because God is for us. And you know, I've read this story over and over many times. And, and in particular, this one passage that always sticks out to me is the validity of Gideon's questions as to why is all of this going on and why is all of this happening. But as I read this res scripture this weekend, just was looking at it, I kind of saw God's response to Gideon as if God was asking Gideon, Gideon, what's going on with you? What's going on in this situation? It's like God, Gideon, God asking Gideon, why do you let everything around you and everything that's happening around you impact who you are? Why are you allowing this season of COVID to determine the size of your faith? Why are you allowing what we're going through as a nation, what you're going through individually to determine what your God can do in your life? 
And God's asking them, hey Gideon, actually, what's going on with you right now? What's going on on the inside? You're looking at everything that's happening on the outside, but God's asking, what's going on on the inside? Where is your faith? Where is your trust in the God of heaven and earth? And God starts to speak to him and say to him, don't allow what's going on around you to determine what I can do in your situation. Now, now this is what I realize is that never allow your identity of who God says you are to be overshadowed by the present circumstances that you're going through. And so Gideon, like so many of us, saw himself and measured his ability and his capability through his own lens. And Gideon's thinking, Gideon's thinking, his behavior, his action has totally been shaped by his family, by his circumstances, by his situation. And this is what I love about God. When God comes to speak to him, God does this. And this is what God wants to do in our lives today. Is the first thing is that God speaks to our potential, not to our insufficiencies. You know, there were so many adequacies in Gideon's life, but God doesn't highlight that. God just overlooks that. He ignores that. He speaks to his potential. The second thing is that God speaks to our divine image, not to our daily dysfunctions. So often we're looking at all of the things that are not working out on a daily basis, and we really forget that we were actually called, and we have a divine image that we've been created in to overcome. And then the third thing is this, is that God speaks to our calling, not to our circumstances. And I want to encourage us that God's called you and there will be circumstances around you that look so great. But the call of God and the presence of God and the power of God on your life is so much greater than the circumstances that you're facing. And then the next thing is this, is that God reveals our purposes instead of highlighting our problems. You know, God doesn't highlight the problem to Gideon. God God just says, hey, Gideon, I'm sending you. This is your purpose. You are going to be the change maker. I'm going to use you to make a difference. And God sees what we are in Him and not what we're necessarily going through. You see, God sees what we are in Him and not who we are in ourselves. And it's so easy when we're going through life, facing challenges, difficult seasons, that we lose sight of who God calls us to be. And this is what's happening this year. I think that this year has really, really shaken so many people's faith. And I want to encourage us today that there is going to be seasons that we go through in our life beyond this year, beyond 2021, that are going to be so uncertain that we're not going to know what the outcome may be, but we can know who God calls us to be. And even though we're feeling like we're restricted in certain areas of our life, and some people maybe have even facing, you're facing overwhelming circumstances and challenges in your life. I never want to be insensitive to that. But I do want to remind you that God doesn't change who, we, who He says we are because of what we go through. He calls us to make a difference. You know, it wasn't easy for Gideon. The people that God had called him to deliver, they were opposing him. The enemy was trying to kill him. He only had 300 men to defeat armies of thousands of people. But God was with him. See, God is calling each of us to stand up. It's a time, church. I'm speaking into our hearts now and into our spirits. It's time to stand up. Don't allow what's going on to define who your God is and the God that's living on the inside of you. It's time for us to stand up, to go to work and do what God can do in our life. You see, we can't change what's happening around us if we're not prepared to do something about it. You see, this is what I know in my life, which I believe would be true in your life, is that sometimes we can't change the circumstances, but we do have the power to change what's happening within us. And how we see in life and what God can do. And the way we do that is by starting to renew our mind by God's Word. We start to hold on to the promises and the plans of God, no matter what we go through in our life. And this is why we need God's Word in our life. And the power of God's Word in our life brings forth great results in our life. Because God calls each of us to stand up in spite of what's going on or how we think of ourselves, or what we're facing in our personal space, or what the labels that people have put on you. We need God's Word in our life. Look what it says in James chapter 1. It says that anyone who listens to the Word of God, but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away immediately and forgets what he looks like. You know what James is saying? James is saying God's Word is like a mirror. You know, it's safe for me to say this, that most of us are grateful for mirrors. In fact, some people love the mirrors. If you live in a house with just females, you will realize as a male, your mirror time is limited. You know, today we even have mobile mirrors. You got photos, all you do is you flip the, the camera and you got your mirror wherever you are. But you look in the mirror, what does the mirror do? It reflects what you look like. It reflects 
what you're wearing in your life. You know, my younger daughter, I've got my younger daughter, Mia, she's, she just loves the mirror. She wants, she wants to see what she looks like from every angle. Uh, help me, Jesus, because, you know, when, whenever we have an opportunity to talk and she's got a phone in her hand, she'll just like pull out her phone and she's like, Dad, I'm going to take a photo of myself. And she like shows me the photo. This is what, and I'm like, whoa. And it's mirror time in our house is up for grabs. And so the truth is this, you know what I realized about a mirror is that the truth is that most of us and most days we look into the mirror not because we forget what we look like. We look into the mirror to see what we wear in, what it looks like on us. We want to know that what we're clothing ourselves in is in a way that is presentable and looks good on us. And what James is saying is that when we, you and I, we look at the Word of God into the mirror of God's Word, it's like looking into that mirror, it shows you God's standard for your life. Who God says you are, how you to live your life in a life that's pleasing to God. So when you look into God's mirror, you get an image of who God calls you to be. There's the reflection of who you are now and who God says you are. And when you look into the mirror and you see something off that doesn't look good, you address it, you fix it. Like if you're looking at the mirror and you're getting dressed for work or you're going out, if something's like your, your, your shirt's sticking out or lady, your hair's out of place or your makeup's a little bit smudged, what do you do? You fix it. Well, God's Word, when you look at God's Word, God's Word instructs us how to live. And as we look at God's Word, God points out areas in our life that we need to address in our life and that we can fix it so that we can live the life God's called us to live. But James says this, he says that if you look into God's mirror and see what's not right in your life and who God says you are and you don't do anything about it, you know what happens is you walk away and you forget who God says you are. And most people only see one aspect of God's mirror. They see God's standard. And then they go away realizing that, man, in my own strength, I cannot live up to that standard. And this is what was happening to Gideon. You know, Gideon, what he did, he looked at his insufficiency. He looked at his inadequacies. He looked at all of the things that he was lacking in his life and started to live a different version of his life. And whenever you live in a different version of your life, you start living life in a different direction. And so what happens is when Gideon went to the mirror, this is what he looked at. He looked like, man, low self-image, rejection, and he's looking at poverty. And maybe you're looking into the mirror of life. And when you're looking at yourself, what are you seeing? Is that maybe you've seen that maybe, you know, I was an addict. You know, I battle with that. Uh, poverty is part of my family line. I've got a low self-image. I've got rejection. Maybe it's something else. Uh, you're an alcoholic or you're a prisoner of your past or you've just had failure after failure. And you keep looking into this mirror and, and maybe you're insecure. Maybe it's, you're inadequate. You're just, you're not enough. You don't measure up. And so every day what you're doing is you're looking at the label that's on the mirror that you're putting yourself, that you're putting on yourself, and you're not really seeing who you are. You're seeing the label, and you're putting all these labels on, and your vision of who you are is blurred. And whenever your vision is blurred, you either settle for where you are, or you go and live life in a different direction. And this is what happened to Gideon. He looked at all of these things in his life, but God's mirror, He not only shows us who we are or how to live. It shows us that everything that Christ has done for us by fulfilling the standard of the law. Look what it goes on and it says in the scripture, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So what do I have to do? I have to lean on Christ's righteousness because Jesus was the one who met the standard. I can never meet the standard. My, listen, my own identity is flawed outside of Christ, but in Christ Jesus, I am righteous. God has restored me. God has accepted me. I live in Christ's righteousness. My, my identity in Him is secure. And the moment I look into God's mirror, I see the righteousness of Jesus. I see everything that Jesus accomplished on the, on the cross. When I look at God's mirror and I come into the mirror that, and look into the Word of God and look at through the lens of Christ's righteousness, what do I see? I see that, you know what, when I'm not enough, Jesus was enough. When I failed and I sinned, I was unrighteous, but now I'm righteous because of what Jesus did. I was rejected, but now I'm accepted. I was weak, but now I'm powerful. I was a captive, but now I live in freedom. I was weak and I'm 
I'm strong. I was failing, but now I'm more than a conqueror. I was lacking, but now I am blessed. Because whenever I look through the lens of what Jesus has done, I am complete in God. And so you and I got to learn to lean on and see what God sees through His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, God got Gideon to see past his challenges, past his own insecurities, and see who he really was. And today I'm praying that whatever label which has been put on your life, or whatever lie that has been spoken over you about who you are and has caused you to live in a way, made you to live the wrong version of who God says you are, that it would be removed in the name of Jesus and it would be removed from your life and the vision would for God, that God has for your life would just come back into your life. And I'm praying that you will get clarity and you will realize that what's going on out there is not as important of who God is on the inside of you and what God is trying to do on the inside of you. What did Gideon have to do? Gideon had to get the right version of who God says he was. The second thing that we've got to do is, as we see that Gideon had to do is that Gideon had to go in God's strength. He had to go in the strength that God had given him. You see, God gives us strength to do what he calls us to do. And Gideon had to stand up. Gideon had challenges that he had to deal with in his life. God says, I'm sending you and I will be with you and I am with you no matter what you're going through. No matter how adverse the situation is, no matter how afflicted you feel, I am with you. God is calling you to stand up. God is calling you to go in His power and His strength. You know what I realize is that life at times can be ruthless. Best of times, life is tough. Best of times, we face challenges. You see, adversity is part of the Christian walk, we face that adversity on a daily basis or seasonal basis that we face times that are challenging. Adversity is simply this. It's a condition marked by continuous obstacles, hardships, challenges. But you know what it means to advance? It means to advance means this. It means that you're going to break through in adverse circumstances. You know, this is a fact that every single person in life faces challenging season. Adversity is a part of the game. We cannot choose adversity. Adversity happens to us, but we do have a choice on how we're going to respond to adverse situations and conditions. You see, we can ask what's going on, or we can say God has chosen me and God is sending me to change the game. You know, our attitude in adversity really determines how we're going to get through in life. You see, Gideon could have had the attitude, he could have, had the, he could have continued with the excuses, he could have continued believing that he wasn't enough, that he wasn't going to make it, that he was the weakest, that his clan was the least. But you know what, he decided to trust God's word. He tried to put his confidence in God, and as a result, God gave him victory. Adversity is a part of life. Look what it says in Genesis chapter 41. It's speaking about Joseph in a foreign land with everything against him. Look what he says. Joseph says this, God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. What a great promise that no matter what's going on around us, that we can still be fruitful, that we can still increase and we can still see God's goodness at work. So what we got to do is that we got to to look into God's mirror. We got to go in God's strength. And there's a couple of other things that I just want to point out that will really help us. Number one is this, is that if we're going to see God get us through tough seasons and we're asking God what's going on, getting through the circumstances we're facing, the first thing we got to do is we got to reconnect to the source. You see, Gideon reconnected to the power of God, to who, he, who God was in his life. We've got to reconnect to the source. The second thing is obey God's word. You know, they had to obey God's word and repent of their evil. Gideon had to get up and do what God asked him by destroying the false gods. We've got to, we've got to obey God's word. The, se- the third thing is this, is that we've got to refuse to be a victim. Hey, I want to encourage us. In South Africa, let's not have a victim mindset. Let's not settle because of everything that's happening around us. Let's believe that God has called us for greater things. And number four, what we've got to do is we've got to go sow good seeds. You know, in this season, we've got to sow good seeds. If you're on social media, what are you putting out there? How are you treating people? What are you sowing into your career? Whatever you're sowing is what you're going to reap. And number five, we've got to keep persisting. You know what I love what Paul writes here? He says here in Philippians 3, he says, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, he says, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize. You know what Paul is saying? I'm not settling where I am. I'm going to keep being persistent. 
I'm just going to keep breaking through. I'm not going to, I'm just going to keep sowing good seeds in life. I refuse to be a victim of my circumstances or my upbringing or my situation. I'm going to, I'm going to believe that God has created me to be a more, I'm going to look into the mirror of Christ and everything that He's done. I'm going to sow good seeds. I'm going to refuse to be a victim. I'm going to obey God's word and I'm going to reconnect to the source. And as Gideon did this and he stood up, God gave him the victory. And today I want to declare over your life that victory is waiting for you. God says in His Word that the battle is mine and the victory is yours. So what do we got to do is we got to realize that Christ in us is the hope of glory. That Christ has done more than enough in us. And when we learn to lean on Jesus and we learn to lean in His power, follow His ways, obey His Word, live according to that. And even when we stumble, even when we fall short, we realize that through Jesus Christ, God has accomplished everything and we don't lack what we need in this season to be all that God has called us to be. And maybe this season's been a rough season for you and you're saying, God, what's going on? God, why are we experiencing this? I want to encourage you to change the question and say, God, what's going on inside of me, Lord? Help me, Lord. Build me, strengthen me, empower me by your Spirit so that I can be all that you've called me to be and do all that you've purposed for my life in Jesus name right where you are today I want to give you the opportunity maybe you've heard this message and this message has resonated and maybe clips of the message have spoken into your heart today I want to let you know that with Jesus Christ all things are possible you see the starting point of a relationship with God begins with Jesus Jesus the Bible says is the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end he's the beginning of salvation he's the beginning of a relationship with God and he's the one that completes our salvation in the end so that we can have an eternal relationship with God and today maybe you don't know God maybe you don't have a personal relationship with him and today you say you know what today I need to make that decision with my life maybe you used to follow God and everything in the season has made you find yourself asking the question what's going on what's going on with my faith not just what's going on out there but what's going on with my spiritual life and today you know that it's time for you to come back and be back in relationship with God. I want to pray that today that God is going to move your heart, that your spirit is going to be turned towards God. And that you're going to say, God, today I'm coming back to you, God. I'm reconnecting to the source of power, God. I'm not going to be a victim of this season, God. I'm going to sow good seeds into my life. I'm going to obey your word, Lord. And I'm just going to be persistent and keep going on. If that's you today and you say, you know, I want to say that prayer. I'm going to pray this prayer over you right now. And as I do, I want to encourage you just to believe every word that I'm praying. Ask God to do a work in you as, you as I pray this prayer over you. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for every person today, God. I thank you, Lord, that you love every man, every woman who's listening to this message. And you've got great plans and great purposes. And we know that those plans and purposes are found in you and you alone. And it starts with your son, Jesus, who died on the cross and forgave us of all of our sins and, and paved a path for eternity for each and every single one of us so that we could have personal relationship with you. So today, Jesus, I surrender my life to you and I ask you to forgive me of all the things that I've done in my life and to cleanse me and purify me and give me a brand new start today. And from today onwards, Jesus, I surrender my life to you and say that I'm all yours and I'm following after you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me salvation. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Come on, if you prayed that prayer today, I want to tell you it's the greatest decision. It's the greatest prayer that you've ever made in your life. And we'd love to hear from you right where you are on the screen. There's an icon that says raise hand. We'd love to, to, to click on that icon right now. We want to connect with you and just say well done on this incredible decision. And then also encourage you to take your next step and register for the courses that will come up in the future with our church so that you can get started on this journey. And church, as we go out today, I want to encourage you that you are just like God said to Gideon, a mighty hero. It's time to stand up. It's time to make a difference. It's time to realize that God has strengthened us. He's empowered us by His Spirit. Let's go out and make a difference and live our lives for God. God bless you. Have an incredible Sunday and the most amazing week ahead. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us today at our online experience. If it was your first time here or you decided to give your life to Jesus, please follow the links on screen. You can also keep up to date with everything happening by following us on social media at Rayma South. Thank you for being here. See you next week.